2024 is truly going to be an inflection point uh, for heavy duty electrification. There's a lot of fleets that we talk to that know that electrification is the end game. Uh, but I feel that this is truly the starting point year where pilots are happening. People are figuring out what these vehicles mean for their operations. Uh, and those that are waiting to see what happens, I think are going to be on, on their back foot. So the proactive fleets that we're talking to, I think are really at an advantage relative to their peers. Peter Cohen, welcome to the program. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. In your opening, you talked about 2024 being a transformation year for fleets. Help me understand what you mean by that. Sure thing, and thanks for having me. Uh, you know, we've been in this business for a couple of years now, and we think that this is truly an inflection point year where there's been a number of pilots that have been run. Uh, folks are figuring out what electric vehicles mean for their fleets. Uh, and now we're starting to see a transition in plans towards scaled operations. And so there's a number of reasons why electric fleets are a little bit different to operate than their combustion counterparts. Uh, and folks are figuring out uh, what that means and starting to plan really for sizable deployments, uh, which things that are learned in pilots, some things carry over, some things don't. Uh, but it's a really exciting year, I think, as the industry is really on an upswing. Um, we talked um, earlier, Peter, about the fact that commercial vehicles have different needs to the passenger car. Uh, can you give us some of the things you're considering as you look at commercial vehicles and what, what should a commercial operator consider differently to a driver of an individual car? Sure thing. I think the biggest, and this is what our business is, is the charging. Uh, you know, what charging means for a fleet is a little bit different than for you and I with our personal vehicle. It's a mission critical resource versus, you know, if we are trying to figure out charging, we're a little more flexible. It might be at the grocery store or overnight or some combination for a fleet, uh, the business to be done, you know, the vehicle enables the business that they're trying to do, whether that's moving of goods or moving of goods to sell them, whatever it might be. Uh, and as a, as a result, fitting in when and where to charge uh, is paramount to their business. Uh, and that's different than just personal travel. And so as a result, uh, you know, folks like ourselves are, are engaged in you know, charging up fleets as quickly as possible uh, to make sure that they're back on the road, either earning revenue or delivering the goods that are providing the revenue. Um, but as a result, you know, it's, it's a little different than you and I with a passenger vehicle. And businesses that are now considering that adoption, what are the first things you're seeing them do when it comes to that charging journey? Is it all about public? Is it all about overnight on the street? Or is it all about depot charging? I would say it's all about whatever is the most efficient from a capital perspective and a resource perspective way to get the job done. And the job is whatever their vehicle has to do. And I think if, when we talk to fleets, there's a variety of use cases, even within one company for what their fleet might be doing. Uh, and so what we've seen as a really successful strategy is looking at what's the easiest lever to pull. So that's maybe the vehicles that are traveling the least amount of distance or are at a depot where they have a long dwell time. And both of those mean that it's the least amount of charging, which means it's probably the easiest charging to accomplish uh, and starting from there and growing outwards. Uh, we don't see a lot of focus on public charging. Um, I think part of that is reliability, availability, and then also cost. Um, obviously, this is you know case by case dependent and public charging may play a role in certain fleets. Uh, but especially as you start looking towards the heavy duty vehicles, they just can't fit. You can't fit a, a class eight truck into a public charging stall. It's not going to be a very fun experience for anybody. Um, so as a result, then there's an even differentiated need for either private charging at their own depot, um, fleet charging at a shared charging center such as terawatts, uh, or some combination of, of, of both. So that implies, you know, the, the class eight vehicle, a lot of infrastructure around that. Um, where are we on that journey? of the infrastructure. I mean, you're in California where I think electric trucks are coming sooner than other parts of the country. So how's this journey going? California is definitely the epicenter. I think it has the strongest push and pull uh, from, a, from a government perspective in the sense of 
policies to encourage adoption as well as to help with the cost of adoption. Uh, but it's definitely early days as well. You know, like I mentioned earlier, 2024, I think, is truly the, the inflection point where uh, pilots are becoming scaled operations. Um, folks like ourselves are having sites that are coming online to bring the whole ecosystem up. Um, but it's definitely been uh, a experimentation phase to date um, with a number of early adopters paving the way. Um, but it's still, it's still, what is that use case and how do you accomplish it? And what's the best playbook for figuring out where and when to charge? It is still something that's being figured out by uh, fleets and, and their partners. And, and does that use case scenario mean that certain business types are more um, appropriately aligned to the early transition? And therefore, do you see certain groups leading that charge? Yeah, definitely. And that's that's a great point. And, and uh, I think that's what we're seeing where kind of back to my point about the, the shortest amount of distance to be traveled and the longest dwell time within the trucking world. Those are definitely the use cases that are being you know, sought after first as well as I would say ones where there's predictability of the route, because I think there's just with, with electric vehicles, uh, you know, fleets are figuring out what does this mean in my daily operations and business? How many miles can I get out of the vehicle? And what does that look like from a, you know, a use case? When you have a predictable daily operation, you can you know, calculate what that looks like on an Excel sheet or a model, and then put it into plan in actuality and see what happens. Um, adding in more variables on top of that makes things more complicated, whether it be differentiated types of routes and distances or a, mod, a you know, business that changes in terms of what the truck is doing from a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, so you know, the food and beverage industry is seeing a lot of adoption, uh, package delivery, obviously, um, and those are also have lighter and you know, medium vehicles helping. But for food and beverage, you know, there's models where they dwell for 12 hours, and that's a great period to charge up your vehicle especially if it's returning to the same base every day. Um, that does not mean, however, though, that you can just charge at the same you know, warehouse every day if, if you don't have space or power at that warehouse, or maybe you lease the facility and the landlord isn't willing to you know, invest in the infrastructure or your lease duration doesn't line up. So there's still a number of variables that mean that it's not the most straightforward thing just to say, oh, I'm in the food and beverage industry. My truck sits overnight. I'm, I'm good to go for charging. Um, and that's where we come in sometimes. Uh, but it's definitely a promising uh, business division for where electrification is seeing a lot of advancement. So I'm getting a fairly clear view on the fact that you've segmented this market, you understand who's doing what and where, but where does your business come into this? What are the services that TerraWatt provides and how do you help these early pioneering customers make that transition? Yeah, so we've raised a billion dollars of capital to develop charging centers across the country. Um, the reasons for doing that are to make uh, the lives of our partners that we engage with easier. And our partners can be anybody who is either moving goods uh, as their primary business or moving goods to enable somebody else's primary business, you know, selling of the goods. Um, and what we're trying to do there is alleviate these pain points where, like I mentioned, if you want to engage in electric vehicle charging, you need to figure out where you're going to have the space and the power and the capital, and then probably some patience to develop it all. Uh, and if any one of those levers is not fully pulled, then you're gonna have to figure out a new plan. So we are developing these charging centers amongst our customers' locations, as well as intermittently uh, spaced throughout routes that they're engaged on to provide charging at scale. So in a perfect world down the line, terawatt charging centers will be all across the country um, everywhere that a fleet needs when they need a, either a top-up charge or a longer dwell charge. Um, but for now, a lot of our focus is in California, given that's where we're hearing demand from the market, uh, as well as we've announced we're electrifying the I-10 corridor. So from everywhere from LA to Texas, uh, we have stations along the way um, and coming a lot coming online this year and into the next few years where it's going to be really exciting to see that happen. Um, but the main goal is just to relieve the, relieve the, uh, the pressure uh, of developing all of this for yourself when it's not your core business uh, and making our, our, our fleet partners' lives a lot easier. So, so when you describe the charging centers there, uh, you describe them as strategically located public charging that any commercial operator can access, but you also describe them as uh, building within the compounds or the locations of your customers and therefore more like semi-private charging. How do you define that and, and how's that going? 
Yeah, so we call them, I guess, semi-private is a good is a good terminology shared amongst a few fleets. The key reason there is back to you know the mission critical asset of charging. This needs to keep the vehicles moving every day, and as a result, um, the vehicle fleet owners want you know certainty of availability. So we have a reservation system that manages our sites to know that I'm fleet A and I'm showing up at 10 a.m. and I need a stall available, and I'm fleet B and I'm showing up at 1 p.m. Uh, we want to carve out space to know that. Uh, they're coming and that the charging is available for them because if they show up and the charger is unavailable or it's not working, that's that's lost time and lost revenue. Uh, so that's core to our mission and that'll be how we figure out, you know, if we're around five warehouses or if we are where a couple of fleets strategically need to be on their routes, uh, we can work with them to make sure that the operational schedule meets, you know, the charging. Uh, and, and everything in between, which is really great. And it makes it more efficient. That's another piece is a shared charging center means that we can spread the costs of all of our infrastructure development across a few fleets, as opposed to uh, putting that burden on any one particular operator, uh, which brings the costs down and really helps with TCO. You mentioned before that you have infrastructure from LA out to Texas on I-10 quarter. So is long haul trucking actually at the point where folks are considering sending long haul routes. So are those going from the port in LA all the way to Texas? Is that kind of the vision? That's the vision. I think it's, it's, it's earlier days relative to the other business models of where EVs are being applied. Uh, but we want to prove that it's possible. So taking our stake in the ground to show, you know, we're building this infrastructure and charging will not be the reason why this is not possible uh, to meet our partners halfway and make sure that, you know, if they want to accomplish moving freight from LA to Texas, we'll be a partner to do it along the way with them. Um, it is a little bit earlier days in terms of uh, where the vehicles are from a range perspective and a charge time, um, but we're seeing some really exciting movement uh, along that path to to you know pave the future for what's what's capable. And then there's been some talk of kind of a mission free quarters where where transportation would be there. How do you play into that? In terms of the the government uh, announcement from recent, yeah. So we're really excited to be a part of you know in the phase one corridors which are targeted the i-10 where we are developing is is part of that uh, and i think it just gives a lot of confidence you know you mentioned earlier california being the epicenter and what happens outside of california and the rest of the country there's a lot of country outside of california um, i think it just gives confidence for everyone to figure out where to focus where to align efforts and resources to make sure that you know we're we're building in sync this is a large ecosystem infrastructure is part of it uh, but the shippers and the carriers and everyone involved in it is, is a really you know, nuanced interaction. So having alignment in terms of where to focus and you know, in, invest resources just gives everyone help to you know, de-risk what they're working on. No one wants to be isolated in terms of where they're putting you know, a project um, such that there's more opportunity to, to engage in either commercializing your fleet uh, or getting custom, uh, fleet partners to, to carry your goods for you. All right. At face value, this makes sense, and it seems relatively easy. Um, and a billion dollars sounds like a big number to the average person, but this is a pretty tall order, right? I mean, there, it seems like there's a lot of steps. So what are kind of the chicken egg problems that you're trying to solve here? Yeah, definitely a billion dollars at first glance would seem like a lot of capital. It's definitely the, also the tip of the iceberg. This is going to be a, a new industry, a new asset class that needs to be developed truly. And uh, for us, that goes towards real estate, ac real estate acquisition, securing power from the utilities, uh, investing in all the charging resources and developing and constructing our sites. So there's, there's a lot there, even for any particular one site. Um, but in terms of what we need to do as an industry to move forward and the chicken and the egg, which gets thrown up a lot, it's just everyone needs the confidence. And it's kind of a three-party arrangement. It's the, the folks that are moving the goods the folks that are actually providing the trucks to move those goods and then the charging to make it all happen. Um, so it's 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 kind of a lot of that Spider-Man meme where everyone's pointing at each other to figure out who, who does the first step. Um, but you know we are committed to being at least building the infrastructure such that that's not one of the, the steps that's, that's not taken. Um, but it's very exciting just to have uh, alignment with really forward thinking partners that are along this mission with us. Uh, and figuring out what is the business model. Maybe it's different than what traditional fueling looks like, and there's new ways to engage, uh, at least at the early days of figuring out what this industry is. Um, but it makes my job really exciting that every day we're talking to you know forward-thinking partners that are on this mission, and at the end of the day, we're doing good for the planet. So that makes it all really exciting too. 
Can we talk a little bit more about the the physical requirements and the setup at these charging stations? Um, I've had the the pleasure of sitting in and driving an electric truck. They're big vehicles, and you referenced Class Eight trucks earlier, which I had to look up, but they're the really big ones. Um, how do you design for um, these much much larger vehicles? Are you looking at huge power capacities? Are you looking towards the megawatt charging standard? You know, what are your considerations when you actually build one of your sites? Yeah, definitely. It's a balance between, uh, you know, what is the best outcome for the fleet in terms of cost and power. Uh, so for us, we're putting in pull through stalls at our, at our sites, which take up more space, uh, but definitely give a lot more operational flexibility for the fleet. And so what I mean by that is they can be a truck. So the class eight actual where the driver sits, as well as the trailer that gets, you know, has all the goods inside of it pulled with them. Uh, and that's that takes up more space because the trailer is a lot longer than the truck itself. Um, but it means that we can charge vehicles while they're on shift, while they're moving along the way, as opposed to just while they're parked, um, not doing business. And that ultimately is where we think the industry is going in terms of shorter t- charge times, more intermittent charging throughout the day, not just sitting for a long charge. Uh, and that really is more reflective of how freight moves today with you know current diesel fueling. So megawatt charging, which you, you alluded to, is definitely going to be a big unlock for the industry and bring charge times down to more similar to what folks see with with diesel fueling. Uh, And I think that'll just make it a lot easier to to do business. Right now, uh, it's definitely a bit of this this transition uh, in terms of where the best charging is and what the time is to sit and and find that. Um, But we're excited that technology is just really advancing at a pretty rapid clip in that vehicles are getting further range, faster charge times, the chargers themselves are getting cheaper and faster and better. Um, so it's only going to be easier from here. Uh, and as us as an infrastructure developer, we want to build for flexibility. So in terms of our design of our sites, we're future proofing. We're putting in faster chargers than the trucks can take on the market today to play our part in the ecosystem. We're thinking about how do we upgrade our sites over time. We're taking those big bets because we really believe in this mission and want to just make it simpler for everyone else to come along the ride with us. Is there a change in the way trucking has been done that's going to come as the, the paradigm shifted, right? I mean, we have all these truck stops and there's known junctions, you know, if you're eight hours from a port or a certain distance or what you can drive or whatever the, the regulation is, is that going to change with, with electrification of those heavy vehicles? That's a good question. I mean, you think you see trends over time of the, the life of the long haul trucker and what does that look like? And with charging, does it mean that there's a more of like a Pony Express model where two drivers meet halfway and then go back to their separate homes. Uh, I think the, it, it, it provides a new page in the book to figure out what is possible, what is the best outcome. It all comes back to what is, what is the job to be done? You know, what is the most efficient way to get point, goods from point A to point B, which in the U.S. is a really substantial part of our economy. Um, and I think it just means that people are taking a new approach to figure things out, knowing that it's not just an iteration on existing technology, it's a new technology. And that means that with that comes new standards and new rules and practices. Uh, and I think that it's really an inflection point, truly in a number of ways for the industry, figuring out what does this mean for us going forward? What is the, the best way to get the job done? Now, also, if, if what you're talking about, you're working with fleet owners, how about independent owners and operators? Are, are they gonna be in a position, because if these are semi-private or power charging stations go with the vehicle, when or does it get to the model where we still have independent owner operators that can then take advantage of this infrastructure? Definitely. And we're talking to fleets of all sizes. So, you know, we have some sites in Los Angeles that are closer to the port and the port is serviced a lot by these independent operators or smaller drayage providers. Um, And, you know, we want to service the entirety of the industry. So maybe they are a little bit later to the adoption curve relative to who's purchasing these vehicles because they are a little more expensive right now. Um, but ultimately, we see the market evolving where this, you know, the reservation model, as we described it, maybe is a really good service for medium or larger fleets. Um, and then maybe there's a different model for how to engage with those smaller, those smaller businesses over time. Um, you know, we're trying to figure this out and just best serve the market and see where there is demand. Uh, and as that opens up, we want to be open to, you know, truly servicing this industry. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over time. Uh, as just more adoption yields more investment and more focus on servicing this industry uh, in its entirety. So, Peter, I can hear that you're super passionate about this space. 
Do you mind if I ask how you came to join Terawatt? What was the beginning of your journey on this sort of electrification of mobility space? Yeah, that's a good question. So I've been focused on mobility in general, uh, mostly on the light duty side of things. So I worked at some um, ride hailing companies uh, and food delivery companies in my past life uh, and knew actually the investors who started the idea of Terawatt. Uh, we were both on a fellowship, uh, which is brings together folks on internships that were just interested in new technologies. Uh, and so as a result, they approached me and said, hey, we have this idea it fits really nicely with your background. And since then, it's been a great ride. So it's been almost three years for me personally, uh, working at Terawatt. And the industry has come a long way in that time. So obviously, the light duty side of the industry, which we didn't talk too much about today, but is, is core for us, has come a really long way in that time. And there's more EVs in the road, and both from a passenger and a fleet perspective. And the heavy duty market has truly been newer for me, but just an, ex an exciting industry to learn about from the perspective of it's everywhere. And, and I'm meeting companies who are I've probably touched with respect to they deliver my goods or I, the food that I eat at a restaurant, but it maybe never heard of before and multi-billion dollar industry that I, you know, I'm learning so much about, but really just meeting exciting people who are trying to solve this interesting problem together, which, like I said, makes my job really interesting. So I'm excited to see what happens this year, next year and into the future. Uh, it, it truly is going to be a really exciting ride. And, and I heard you differentiate quite strongly there between the heavy duty and the light duty. Do you see um, a space for some of those, uh, maybe not as small as passenger cars, but larger commercial vans and the like using this infrastructure because they face some challenges that passenger cars maybe do not when they're charging? 100%. And I think that's a result also similar to the heavy duty market of uh, you have a fleet that operates in and around uh, a, a base of operations or has certain routes uh, and the question being, well, where can you charge those? I think different from the heavy duty market, those vehicles are closer, if not already at cost parity um, to their diesel counterparts. And so as a result, um, you've seen them being deployed all across the country uh, versus you know, just in a market like California where there's subsidies on the vehicles. Um, but as a result, also then now you're getting to the point where if you have 100 locations to deploy your vehicles at and you found the 10 that have power and space and you've started there, okay, maybe now you're starting to figure out where, where do I have a pinch point in power and space? Or is this the most effective way to actually charge those vehicles now that I've had more comfort with them? Can I rely on public and or offsite char fleet charging? So I think it's, it's, it's also coming along in the sense of what is the best and most efficient business model to engage? Again, back to it all comes to the simple point. The job to be done is to move things on a vehicle from point A to point B, whatever that looks like. And charging is just a means to an end. What is the most efficient way to do that from a cost perspective, from an operations perspective? There's now increasingly a new number of options to do that. Um, and it just means that folks are opening their eyes to saying, okay, well, maybe I've done things a certain way, but maybe I can do them a different way. And what, what does that look like? You, you mentioned a lot this learning curve that we're going through and the data points you need. But I, I kind of am a little skeptical because route planning has been done forever. People optimize based on the old infrastructure. So what kind of software and tools are available or do you need to have better insight to make this efficient going forward? That's a great question. And it seems like so far at scale, EV has you know maybe lived on a side project with respect to the number of vehicles in a fleet and, and what that looks like for their operations. Okay, here's my EV side of things and here's the rest of my business. And how do they integrate? Um, I think that's a great point in sense of what does it need to look like for matching the existing business from, from a routing perspective? I think that it, it's still being figured out. So there's a lot of simulation that gets done ahead of time, but no one really knows what's going to happen with the vehicles until they hit the ground and start moving goods. And so you are seeing a lot of testing in different climates and different altitudes to see what's the impact on range and, and you know, charge times. So a lot of data that's being aggregated and there's a lot of um, organizations out there that are putting out the findings of these data from um, you know, uh, trial runs and pilots and programs to make sure that education is distributed. Um, but fleets are definitely figuring out, okay, how do I optimize the most mileage out of these vehicles, most efficient you know, usage of the asset uh, to make sure that they're getting their business done. I also see on your website, you have calculators for diesel versus electric. How important is that price in this decision? Is that really one of the drivers that fleets are looking at? Or is there other considerations that outweigh the cost of fuel? 
it's it's all all things. So it's 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 the vehicle is a big part of it. Obviously, it's a starting point. Without a vehicle, there's no EV. Um, but then the charging infrastructure and the fueling cost. So for our business model of really big unlock is you know we have a site call it down the road from a fleet. Their options are either to invest in capex, which means upfront capital for them to develop, put in at least you know even one charger at their own site. Um, that's capital upfront, and they have to amortize that over however many years. Uh, if they use our site, they pay an operating line item. So it's just a fueling expense, a monthly payment, more akin to, you know, most people go to a truck stop or a gas station to get their fuel. They're not building their own gas station on their own site. Sometimes people do that, but, you know, just for simplicity. So it's, it's all about this total cost of ownership, the TCO that, that gets thrown around a lot and figuring out what does that mean for my particular business? How am I, you know, wh what, how many miles am I putting on the vehicle every day? And, and how am I returning the investment I'm making on that asset? Fuel is a huge part of it, but it's not the entire story. So we put that out as a resource to say, okay, if I'm thinking about what EVs mean for my business, I obviously have to charge them. And what does that mean relative to, you know, if I go to my truck dealer or my vehicle sales representative, I can understand the cost of the vehicle, but that's not the operational cost. So it's the pillars I would say are the vehicle costs, the infrastructure, and then operating and maintaining it. Um, and there's variations in terms of what that might mean to a particular business based on how they use that vehicle in the in the And I also noticed in your example that you're in nice warm places, LA, Texas. Um, how does this work in colder climates if I'm driving a truck road on an ice road in Alaska or something of that nature? It's definitely gonna be, I think, a little slower on the adoption curve for exactly the reason of, you know, the battery range and what it means. But as long as the vehicle can get the job that needs to be done, you know, done, the vehicle should do just fine. So if, you know, maybe a range gets impacted by 15% or something, I don't know, the, the exact figures obviously depend on the, the, the environment, but if that still gets jo the job done that you need it to, great, that's all that you need to do. So I think range and, and what it means relative to climate is something that folks are figuring out for their business. Um, but it still means that these are very viable vehicles and there's been a lot of advancements with respect to battery technology and installation of the battery and impacts on range there too. There's a, a concept I've been introducing recently um, to public charging in the UK, which is what I'm calling total cost of charging, because we quite often hear about total cost of ownership. So the logical jump to total cost of charging isn't huge. What we hear people say is, oh, well, it only ch cost me 20 pence to charge at my depot, but it cost me 80 pence to charge in public. Uh, so I try and spend a lot of time explaining what the difference is between the cost of building out the infrastructure and thereby creating a total cost inclusive of infrastructure, insurance, space, grid connection, all the stuff that comes with it. Do you see that debate emerging as well between people going, oh, it's really cheap to charge at my depot and then invest in their own infrastructure versus the public charging dynamic that you're obviously presenting, where theoretically over time it will become cheaper uh, because you're sharing it over many users? Definitely, because I think, you know, in both cases, someone has to pay for the energy. And so for when you use an offsite charging solution, there's an added cost for the infrastructure and the operation and maintenance and the team to build it all. And so I think it's a question of our fleets evaluating, first of all, the, the resource drain and the headache that it might be to deviate from their primary business to build charging at whatever scale that might be. And maybe that works for one to two chargers at their own facility, but we do see a lot of uh, now the page turned in 2024 again of a lot of early adopters have gone through that process themselves with partners for sure, but maybe not necessarily someone managing the whole process for them or, or whatever that might look like. And now I've turned the page to say, okay, well, I did that once. I learned a lot. I'm going to offshore it or I'm going to work with a partner or some kind of combination to focus on their core business um, because they do value at least that resource perspective of the, the, the human capital. Um, and then on top of that, yes, the capital expense upfront to invest in these assets is a large one. Uh, and so something that we feel strongly that sharing across multiple fleets brings that total cost of ownership down uh, pretty dramatically. And so we've done a lot of work to educate our partners and, and look through, okay, well, option A maybe is to do it on your own site. Option B would be to work with us. Here's the tipping point where that makes a lot of sense. Um, because I like to say, if you put in two chargers at your own site, well, you're paying for 100% utilization of two chargers and you can only use two at once. If we put in 20 chargers at our site, well, you can use two maybe today. And then maybe if you scale your vehicle fleet up with 10 more vehicles, we still have more chargers, uh, but you're still only paying that volumetric rate for uh, what you consume. 
Uh, and so it's a much more efficient and scalable solution. Uh, it's been really exciting to engage with our partners and start to see that market mature. And I guess the other big thing that you're starting to see in that dynamic is the future proofing element. Uh, we've seen transitions from 400 volt vehicles to 800 volt vehicles, higher power charging speeds, things like the ISO 15118 plug and charge standard. I'm assuming you're tackling all of that and helping customers on that journey. Yeah, and that's another added benefit. So we have a dedicated hardware lab where we're interoperability testing all of the infrastructure we put at our sites, making sure that the firmware from the charger works with the firmware from the vehicles, uh, constantly iterating on new technologies, new ways to connect. Um, and that's something that the, you know, our, our fleet partners get to benefit from when they work at our sites, because ultimately it just needs to work. We put in a lot of time and resources to make sure that when they show up, it just works. Uh, and simplifying that down means that we're doing a lot of work on the back end to accomplish that, um, to just relieve that headache from ever being something to cross someone's mind. Yeah, I was um, laughing with someone earlier today about the complexity that we are disguising from our customers because all they want is for it just to work. But the levels of complexity involved in making sure that the, the handshake with the charger works, the charging system then you know builds the right people, you've got the reliability, the accessibility requirements all handled it makes a massive difference to customers to ensure that we're getting that simplified experience. Um, if you were to like roll out a case study customer or a case study example of someone who's really gone through that experience, what's your sort of like hero customer that you talk about day to day? Uh, in terms of like a specific name or just a profile of what they've done? I think, I think we've seen is, uh, there's, there's been a, a few folks who have been pioneers in the space and they've tried different environments, different business models, charging onsite, charging offsite, and they've kind of iterated on all the pain points to understand, you know, the knowledge of what charging means for their particular business and are distributing information to their partners. There's some great meetups of the industry. You know, it's a humongous industry, but I think for electrification purposes, it's still a small one where people are talking to each other and engaging, which is great to share that knowledge. Um, so we've seen a few pioneers in the space that have tried this, you know, extensively themselves in the last couple of years, and now are turning the corner to scale up operations, but also give that learning to the rest of the market that doesn't have to hopefully go through the pain points of figuring it out themselves. They can avoid the, I realize this is hard because I tried it myself for, and, and, you know, stumbled through it for a year versus, okay, I've learned from my peers and trusted them. And I can go the much more efficient route. So we commend the, the pioneers in the space and the first movers and appreciate the work that they've done to you know, pave the way for everyone else to kind of follow them um, and are excited to be working with both the, those early adopters as well as um, the other players who are now entering the space uh, as they can enter much more efficiently. No, it's definitely not already solved, uh, and it's 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 you know to to Neil's point about uh, when there's a total cost of charging. I hate to give the answer, but it's it's it depends. It truly depends, and it's so localized in the sense of what it might mean. And to put up even one charger at a facility is going to be it's not the easiest thing to assess from the outside of okay. Well, I know my power availability. I know what the perming process is going to be like. There's a lot of variables um, that just make it a little more challenging. Uh, in terms of timelines and cost, uh, permitting and zoning is one where, you know, in Los Angeles, for instance, where there is a lot of activity, I think people are more familiar with what a charging site means and what charging stations require because other folks are already doing it. But when you get outside of California, it's still newer territory for folks, especially on the commercial side, where I think, you know, if you're going through the permitting process, you might be the first one in your jurisdiction to do that. And so... I think the, the government funding piece we raised earlier, I think, brings a lot of more confidence also for folks to engage in these activities in a, um, you know, area where there's more, or more, more engagement going on, which just makes it easier for everybody. If there's, you know, a few, a few different parties asking for the same thing, it should grease the wheels to make the process simpler for everyone, hopefully. Um, but it is still early days, especially in, the, in, in what, what this looks like at scale. Uh, even for a site like ours, you know, there's not that many examples to point to in the market. So hopefully as time goes on, that does become less of a 
a bottleneck for the for the for the process. Um, but it's been exciting to engage with the local partners because everyone's really excited about what the end result is, which again, it's clean transportation. It's it's doing good. It's it's bringing emissions reductions to and oftentimes disadvantaged communities. So the desired outcome is there. It's just a question of how do we bring everyone together to make it happen quickly. Now, the second part of my question you kind of already segued into is, is, is there a speculative land grab from companies to try to grab this infrastructure? Because the business model you described was working with fleets, and that seems like you're building on demand. But to get a massive growth, it almost seems like you would have to speculate that people, if you build it, they will come. And that somebody would want to be a clear winner there, and they would be racing to get a land grab here. Is that start of the race started yet? I think it's already, yeah, it started a, a while ago. And we've been acquiring land. And so, you know, we're focused in many states uh, to make sure that we're ready when the market's ready and, and making sure that that timing matches up nicely where we bring a charging site online the day before the fleet needs to start doing their business. Uh, but charging development takes a long time. So it's a bit of proactive and reactive matching where we're listening to the market and where what we think is the next area where there's going to be focus. Um, but those development timelines can take 12 to 18 plus months, depending on power availability and different process permitting and zoning, as we alluded to. So it's it's a really interesting um, dynamic where it's you know the chicken and the egg, but it's like we're building the nest more or less to figure out or the, the chicken coop. Uh, and that takes more time than vehicles can be delivered pretty quickly or their mobile charging is finite. So definitely we think that space and power in point A and if point A is where you need it to be is more valuable than point B if point B is not where you need it to be. Um, so we're trying to be really advantageous about uh, the capital that we've raised and it gives us the ability to go and start seeding this industry with charging uh, where fleets need it and bring it online when fleets need it. So we're very excited to play that part. And my last question before we go into the close is I can't help but thinking transformers have a backlog. You just can't get transformers in the U.S. today. And and those dates you just, I mean, I, I think even if you're fairly well respected, it's about a 12-month backlog right now for transformer. Um, and I think it's been longer. So that doesn't seem to jive with what you just said. How are we going to put all this infra infrastructure in place when we have that backlog? Or do you see that not being a gate? I think planning is the really important piece. So this is all we do every day is build charging centers. And so given that focus, we can acquire infrastructure and resources and use it in the future. So, you know, we acquire chargers and spare parts to, to maintain our sites. We can do similar things on the development side with more medium and heavy duty infrastructure. However, there is still a lot of that that's specialized to the specific site. So in all of that, planning is key. Uh, and working with our partners, working with the governments, working with the utilities to make sure that we can carve out a roadmap for multi years uh, to give everyone the confidence. So I think, you know, back to the the the, the joint uh, office or release about the charging corridors. Again, it gives confidence, it gives alignment, it gives focus where people can start planning uh, for processes that take multiple years and sometimes, uh, but knowing that everyone's focused on the same thing. So I think that alignment is really key uh, because there are certain things that just truly backlogged to your point. And it might be transformers today. It might be something else tomorrow. Uh, but making sure that we're all swimming in the right direction uh, definitely helps. Peter, I, I asked all our guests one final question. It's to get your crystal ball out. You made some bold statements at the beginning about 2024 being transformative. What is going to be different in 2025 that you can predict? And go, go lean into this. I think 2025 is going to be a year where we see big vehicle orders coming through in the heavy duty market where folks are confident that they, you know, know their charging provider, they know their operational schedule, and they can go lean in to get 100 vehicles or, you know, deploy a lot of vehicles in one place. Uh, it's going to be really exciting to see that happen. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. It's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you both. It's been great. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Insider's Guide to Energy EV series. If you have, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us. And don't miss out on our YouTube channel. It's a great place to catch this content. We'll talk to you again soon on the Insider's Guide to Energy EV series. Bye for now.